I do not believe the conditions that produced a situation that demanded a song like that. Hello everyone and welcome to session three of the Global Black Feminist Reading Circle. My name is Randy Henderson and I am one of the Black Feminist Reading Circle members of this online group. This session runs from January 20th until June 2nd and includes two week long breaks. Our democratically selected reading material is Harriet A. Washington's book, Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present. Our book group meets each Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8 on the Google Plus Hangouts on Air platform. You may find the, Glo the Global Black Feminist Reader Circle on Google Plus, YouTube, and Facebook. And always feel free to join us in reading our story together. I'm tonight's moderator, Georgette Moses from Columbia, South Carolina. Let's go around and everyone introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Edwina Marchenko. I'm happy to be here. Well, I'm located here in Utah now. Hello, I'm Brandy, and I'm viewing from Atlanta. And I'm really excited to see everybody tonight. And I'm happy that I'm on time for like the first time in months. So <laughs> this is really nice. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. Hi, good evening. My name is Neil Walker, and I'm a... Wayne from uh, Connecticut. Welcome. 
Thank you, Benita. Uh, my name is uh, Joel J.J. Jones uh, from um, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and uh, just glad to be here amongst the living, not the dead. All right. Can't <laughs> argue with that. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Hi, I'm Michelle Odom, and I'm in Brooklyn, New York. We can get started on Chapter 8, The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. The Black Stork, The Eugenic Control of African American Reproduction. This chapter illustrates the various ways the reproductive freedom of African Americans have been assaulted by discouraging the birth of inferior black children and by curtailing the fertility of black mothers. Americans of various backgrounds and allergenists, allergenists, allegiances, allegiances participated in this eugenics movement. Germans and Americans shared their flawed eugenics practice and beliefs, many of them evolving into current laws and social economic and medical policies today. Many women and men have been harmed by these codified beliefs with no compensation. Some of our own black leaders were complicit in this. We still live with the false specter of the crack baby, stigmatized teenage girls as hypersexual and chose to punish and medicate rather than counsel and protect. Okay. Thank you, Vanita. Okay, I, someone to read section B and the questions that follow, the Negro Project. Okay, Margaret uh, Sanger, the most famous American eugenist, is usually applauded as a powerful birth control pioneer and feminist. She is all of those things. Her mission changed over time from women's rights advocacy to eugenics. She shaped, shaped American uh, reproductive policy by uh, killing the Comstock laws against contraceptive um, distribution and founded Planned uh, Parenthood, the 20th largest charity in the United, in the United States, which <coughs> well, with the help of eugenics and initiatives like the Negro Project, she exploited black stereotypes to reduce the fertility of uh, African Americans. She was a cautious speaker, uh, but uh, Sanger stated in her book, The uh, 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 Pivot of a Civilization, that eugenics is chiefly valuable in its negative aspects on its so-called positive and constructive side. It fails to awaken any permanent interest. She also offered a slew of case histories describing the eugenics problem that black families uh, presented by uh, making unfounded connections between mental disability, vagrancy, overpopulation in the Negro district and criminal activity of surrounding states. Further, she claimed that all members in the black family she studied either died young, went on to leave uh, lives of high hyper uh, set food uh, for <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, uh, which I looked that up. And, you know, but anyway, prostitution, violent crimes, uh, or all three. The Negro District uh, is the headquarters of the criminal element. Beginning in 1932, she recruited black leaders to support her cause. This brother, W. E. Du Bois, Charles S. Johnson, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., and even. Uh, Hold on a second here, I got to scroll down. Even the Reverend Martin Luther King, on the advice, uh, on the advice of the Bulls, she recruited the black church leaders because the most successful educational approach to the Negro is through religious appeal. 
we do not want the word to to get out that we want the uh, to exterminate the Negro population, and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea. If it occurs in any of the of their rebellious members, the both further encourage her by saying black churches were open to intelligent propaganda of any sort. Jesus Christ. And that uh, Sanger uh, and other agencies out to get speak, speaker before church congregations and their arguments in the Negro newspapers. She took the advice and achieved great success by also placing submissive black doctors oh Lord, and staff at doctors and staff soon realized they had no autonomy and uh, and protests. So she closed the clinic, but the damage was already done. Lord Hammer, that sound just if you want to really tick me off, you talk about the black church. But anyway. We ain't gonna go on to church. Do not jump <laughs> I'm trying to stay out the guard area today for all the okay. All right. Why do you think uh, Singer's method of addressing black social ills by applying negative eugenics via birth control clinics was so successful? Why does it continue today? W. E. De Bos wrote in response to uh, Sanger's uh, request for support. The, the mass of ignorant Negroes still breed carelessly and uh, disastrously, so that the increase among Negroes even more uh, than the increase among whites is from that portion of the population least intelligent and fit and least able to rear their children properly. What do you think of this statement and do you see uh, this as a betrayal? Were you surprised at the names of black leaders who participated in Sanger and their reason for going off? <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, well. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. Good questions, uh, Georgia. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. Now, we have to go to church. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> because if you, in my opinion, this is why you see uh, politicians always canvas the black church and they play they pay these black preachers with money and they pay them with influence and power and a sit at, at a seat at the table because they can push one button and these sheeple go and follow okay and this is the same thing that this lady did at the particular time with Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. and it's still true today you know mm -hmm. And it's just as plain as just plain and simple, you know. And you know, you know, if you make it, even if it's, even if it's faulty logic, if you, if you grace them with your divine presence and come and talk to them like they're human beings, they'll feel like they're equal to you, and they respect you, and they will follow you, sheeple. But you don't give a damn about them or their situation and that's what they continue to do and we like fools continue to oblige them and that's why they keep coming with the same playbook just a different day and a different part of the game 
That's all I got to say about that. Okay. Amen. Um, well, well on, the first class, out <laughs> most, um, uh, members of the black church, you know, it's a hierarchy, you know, from the preacher, the, the bishops, and so forth, on down to just the, the tithing, the tithers, the ones who can only put a dollar in the basket, ones who can't. You know that old, the biblical saying, the woman that could only uh, uh, give a little, her, 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 she, her, her, her blessings were greater. And I, when I say that, I, I feel that there's classism within the black church um, that, uh, I mean that the, uh, the, the members, the so-called members, the sisters of the church, the fraternities involved in the churches, uh, <laughs> Um, it's a matter where all the support comes from to keep it. it's the, it's the building fund. You know, whether it's time after you have made your uh, uh, tithing, and the first tithing, then before church is over comes the building fund. Always wonder what you know what the building fund was about because the building was you know falling apart. <laughs> you know, hmm. broken windows, new doors, need fixture, and so forth. But I think that they they were praying there on the um, the uh, um, the people who were in the uh, uh, let's say lower tax bracket, or even the welfare uh, moms, the ones they would call the welfare queens in the church. They were praying on, they were praying. Uh, they were the ones that were bringing all the babies in the church with them, you know, for prayer to get this, get this blessing to increase their bounty, you know. And the church was the uh, uh, place of, uh, Historically, place of uh, uh, where black people congregate, the most black people congregated. So there was that place was a target, and, and naturally you would find uh, the low income bracket, uh, single parents there, and they were the targets to be put under control. More than just the hierarchies of the church, or the boule, or the bourgeois of the church, and that's the problem I have with the black church. Well, I guess I'm gonna have to say a word in support of the black church. <laughs> you, you know, you know I know y'all ain't gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not. I mean, hey. Hey, I just pointed out what's wrong with it. I ain't pointing out what was right. It well, won't take me, but half as exactly, long. And yeah. that's, that's exactly my point, Joel. That that it the church was and is a mixed bag. You know, there were always some good pastors and always some bad pastors, and there still are. Um, you know, but. It, you know, and I, I'm not a religious person, and I don't go to church on any regular basis. Vanita and I were trying to figure out earlier today, is it Easter coming up this weekend? Yes, yeah. uh, Easter, April the 5th, <laughs> Sunday, April the 5th. Uh, so, but, uh. I, but I'm a PK, Edwina, so, you know, so I know a little something about, about the black church. Um, and you know, and I just think in every breath that we talk about what's wrong with the church, we also have to to recall and remember the good things that the church has done. the The people that are there, you know, all of them are not sheeple. All of them are not idiots. Um, a, a lot of them are very aware of 
what is going on um, at all levels, but they're there also for whatever benefits they get from being in community. And it's by being in community um, that, that we have been able to make most of the social, political, uh, economic advances that we have made through having those kinds of connections. And, you know, my generation is the generation that walked away from the church to a large degree, but the kinds of connections that were made there have not been replaced in any other significant way. And so all we are is disconnected, you know, and personally, I believe that, you know, you don't have to have morality. When I think of morality, I think of um, somebody saying, you know, well, this, you need to do this because it is right. You need to do this be or not do this because it is wrong. And how do we know what's right or wrong? God says so. Well, you know, that, that's where you get to be able to play with people's heads a lot. But whether we have morality or not, I still strongly believe that we can and should have um, an ethical culture, a, 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 a set of values that we want to promote. And so my generation has not created any alternative system to the church that would help us develop a sense of ethics. Um, when Vanita and I were young, there, there was the expression, my word is my bond. You remember that, Vanita? Well, mm -hmm. Everybody used to say it. And, you know, and it was a statement about character. Um, and so, you know, we're living in this time where nobody much seems to have any character left. And church is a part of where we got that years ago. So, you know, as, as, as much as I know the church is problematic on so many levels, um, it has also done some good for our community. Now, in terms of, of this chapter and W.E.B. Du Bois and Martin Luther King and Adam Clayton Powell and all the black ministers and others, black doctors and others that Harriet calls out, um, that was shocking. And I really don't know what was on their minds. It may have been that they just got paid off to um, be a part of Sanger's uh, agenda. Um, or it may have been their sincere um, attempt to want to address the significant issues in the black community, the issues that we still have, you know. And so the one person that she quotes is Du Bois, but I wish she had quoted MLK you know, or Adam Clayton Powell so that we could get some idea of, of what they were thinking. So I don't know. I just, I feel like she didn't give us enough in that passage to, to really have much of an opinion. I don't know. Oh. I, I, just, I just believe that uh, a lot of times our leaders, I think we just don't do enough thinking about things that we support or don't support or we don't play devil's advocate enough, you know. People can always come at you with, with, uh, with you know, um, false facts or misleading numbers, you know what I mean? And, and I think a lot of times when we hear these crazy numbers about what's going on in the black community and everything, you know, okay, you know, you say, well, you know, you have X amount of percentage of African Americans doing this, and then you only have certain amount of percentages of another race doing that, of the majority race. Well, hell, that may be 
<laughs> you know, there may be their number might be in you know might be in the tens of millions, and yours may just be in the millions. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but you know, so you have to look at this this type of thing, and you know how they accent the negative. You know, and they go and they say, "Well, you got this particular problem." You know, go kill your babies. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. If you kill your babies, the crime rate will go down. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. well. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay, uh, okay, but you said things were crimes that were not necessarily crimes, <laughs> you know. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. Yeah, I think we I just don't do enough. That there was a target, and the target was aimed at the poor communities, the single parent homes, the, uh, the mothers that were labeled as welfare queens. Uh, let's stop them from um, producing more of these uh, children that the, uh, that the taxpayers have to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. If you if you if, if you if you want to if you want to you know just take a you know cultural anthropology class, go and stay go and stand at the local retail store that's in your area and watch how many people of all races come up there and uh, use the uh, use the uh, food assistant cards. That'll let you know a whole great deal of things about where we're at in society and who needs help in our society. Mm -hmm. And it just ain't black people that need help in our society. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, it's a lot of Caucasians that need help in our society. It's not a bad thing that you need. That's what the hell is there for. <laughs> you know, really and you're gonna have a certain you're gonna have a certain okay. percentage of people that abuse that abuse anything. And they are um a high there is a high percentage rate of them who are on EBT who are uh, receiving um general assistance. So, but they are not they, their community is being targeted like the exactly. Uh, Afro-American community, the so-called Negro communities, the single-parent home communities, uh, with just the, the mother and her children, and the, and the fathers in are incarcerated. They're right. not the targets. Yeah, but they they have they white people have been the targets at various uh, stages of eugenic policies. Um, there's a, a not the exclusive target, but they have been included among the target. Uh, uh, well, we call that the military collateral damage. <laughs> okay. 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 There, there's a quote in this book from, uh, <laughs> from Justice Oliver uh, Wendell Holmes that says, three generations of imbeciles are enough. Um, because in the early days of eugenics, they they were passing laws in state after state after state, um, saying that that mentally defective people, um, you, you know, could uh, could be put to death. Mm. So you know, in, including white people here in Utah, they just established. Uh, reestablish the death penalty by um, firing squad. <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. And when um, when that guy, Dr. Hazelden, made the film um, The Black Stork, uh, you know, those were, were, were white babies among the babies. The, the piece that talks about um, Parents were coming forward, you know, asking doctors to kill their disabled children, um, and doctors were were proudly doing it. You know, it, a whole wave got started back then um, that included white children being killed because really, what eugenics is about is not just the color of your skin, but it's anyone, you know, Edwina mentioned classism uh, in the church, but it, it really is a class kind of um, 
Yeah, attitude that some people are just not fit to live. Yeah, so because you're disabled, because you're you're mentally you're a burden. handicapped, yeah. you know, because you're a burden of some kind, you know, in their perception. And that's the problem, that it comes down to someone's perception. I think that was the perception of the Germans in Nazi, uh, in Nazi Germany. Absolutely. All, all mis misfits, all yeah. misfits, and so that we can produce a superior um, person, Yeah. superior yeah. Aryan. Person. Yeah. Georgette, we're at 735. Oh, man. And <laughs> halfway through. Okay. Moving right along. Yes. Um, I, I just, I was not surprised at all about black leaders. Um, um, which, uh, betraying us. I wasn't surprised. It's been going on since the beginning of time, even during slavery. Yeah, Joe just said, well, to Tom. Well, Massa, Tom is took an extra piece of bread, thinking that he was going to get some more privileges by telling Massa that Tom took another piece of bread. Then Massa said to Tom, oh, thank you, Tom. You're such a good boy. Then Massa went back and, and beat the other man to a pulp. Meanwhile, he turned around at Tom and said, Tom, get your ass back out there and finish doing that work. Tom never got any more special privileges, but yet he bought down somebody else in the process. So I wasn't surprised at that at all. It's disgusting. As far as the church is concerned, I have a problem with that. If people would stop revering man, as they do, and it always led to hell behind revering man, then maybe we wouldn't have these kind of problems. Maybe we wouldn't be able to go into the church and convince people so easily of everything. So I, I you know, but I'm not going to get into the Jesus thing today or the God thing. It really is disappointing. I mean, I'm not shocked. I'm just disappointed over and over and over how easily black folk will do things to other black folk for whatever reason they may do it. And for them, it probably was fame, fortune, combination. You know, mm -hmm. I've been always sad with that. Excuse me? May I interject a word in defense of someone? Well, well, we want to move on, Edwina, because Georgette has a lot here. So, okay, we'll just move on. I, I'm done. I just think they were deceived. They were deceived. That's it. That's all I have to say. Okay. No, okay. Here. Okay. What did you say, Randy? I didn't hear what um, Edwina said. Oh, well, she, what said, she said they were deceived. She thinks that those black leaders, they were just deceived. Oh, okay. Thank you. 